G'day folks, I'm uh, just doing a bit of rock hopping out on the, uh, at a point at uh, Kaurong on the New South Wales south coast and I wanted to uh, do a little bit of footage of uh, a very old wreck, well it's not actually that old, it looks older than it is, this is what's left of the SS Marimbula out here on uh, Whale Point. You see there's bits of ironwork scattered all across here. Um, now, I don't mind telling you, I've always had a great love, passion if you will, for all things maritime. Well, maybe not all things, specifically the age of sail. I devour any books or movies or anything to do with that to do with that period of history um, and if it wasn't for that I wouldn't be standing here now because our country was sorry pretty much founded with, uh, with ships and those that sailed them or in them um, I you know I voraciously read anything by Patrick O'Brien and I'm working my way through his 21 novels anyway uh, I wanted to just come out here, it's a beautiful place too. Uh, in March it was the 90 year anniversary of, of the wreck of this steamship. I must say it was a steamship, it wasn't a sailing ship but... Now I've got a little bit of a theory and I hope you'll bear with me. Um, the story is really interesting. And um, I've uh, got a couple of, well I've got one theory about it. I've read quite a bit about it. Especially seeing it was, it was just the anniversary uh, a couple of months ago. I'm sorry about the wind, so I'll, I'll turn away from it when the wind pops up. Um, now, uh, the Marimbula was built in Troon in Scotland, not in the Clyde, like some people say. The Clyde shipyards were famous, but Troon was where she was built. In 1909, um, in the uh, age of steam shippery, if that's a real word, was um, well and truly up and running. Some massive pieces around here, you'll see. Just it's everywhere. The more I the more I look around, the more I'll see. What I really want is a piece of timber if I can find one. Anyway, she sailed to Australia, and she was um, commissioned by the Illawarra Steamship Company. And the Illawarra is uh, a region between here in Shoalhaven and. and and Sydney. Um, it was doing the Sydney to Tathra Eden run and back. She used to carry a fair bit of cargo too. Um, but it was uh, set up mostly. Let me, there you go. There's some timber in that. Scotch, Scotch pine or something that would be. Or maybe oak. It's hard to say. I'd love to be able to take that home. Anyway, it's too big. Um, now, she did the run for quite a while, um, but around that same time, um, the railway line has, was uh, all the way down to, uh, to Bombardieri on the south coast then, and uh, private vehicle use was skyrocketing. People were able to afford cars. There was buses and trams and Basically, the age of steam was starting to uh, slow down. <coughs> Pardon me. So, uh, she had 64, I think it was 64, saloon uh, cabins for paying passengers and seven uh, coach or second class. Um, in 1922, she converted, they can, the company converted those to um, cruise quarters. Uh, she was also losing a lot of trade to uh, to uh, trucks and the railway. So on the uh, 28th of March, or 28th of March, uh, 1928, she was heading out for the Tarpa Eden run out of Sydney, heading south. Hit a really nasty squall, uh, built up, big southerly swell, which you can really good she was three miles inside her track that's the horse pipe right there where the 
anchor chain goes through. There's the rest of it there. That's Hawes H-A-W-S-E. <laughs> um, now she was in trouble and she was foundering so she came in, <coughs> pardon me, and she cut in there. Ended up on the rocks here at about one o'clock in the morning. On a dark, rainy, stormy night. Bow first, I think that is a section of the bow there. Bow first up here on the rocks at Whale Point. Okay, so she was uh, 60, is it 60 meters? So, you know, 100 and, nearly 200 feet. It's a decent sized ship, it really was. She had bars and a piano bar and, you know, it was quite a, quite a nice um, iron lady of the day. Um, so here's where it gets interesting. Captain O'Connor, T. O'Connor, Thomas O'Connor, I think it was. He, um, look at that, there's a nice lump of wood. If I had a mate or two with me, I'd grab that. The way a ton. Um, now, he, uh, all there was at the time, right, right over there, is a creek. There was only a fisherman's shack on the beach over there. That's a fair hike from here, as you can see, especially in a storm at night. So he got everyone comfortable, life jackets on, May Wests, life preservers, whatever they call them, and uh, gathered them in the bar, where apparently they drank coffee and ate sandwiches. <laughs> coffee, yeah, right, I bet it was, if it was coffee, it had something else in it. Anyway, um, they finally got the people ashore, I think, uh, just on dawn. <coughs> as soon as it was light enough, they put the lifeboats in and they got everyone safely ashore on a shack over there. Now, at this time, 20s, the roads would have been virtually non-existent, nothing but tracks. Um, here there's a gannet. Um, and uh, just a few scattering of fishing shacks and that sort of thing down here. Very little timber industry in Niara. But um, there was the lighthouse at Beecroft Peninsula, which is that way, okay? About, I don't know, 15, 20 k's that way. So, Captain Connor got everyone ashore and he heads off to um, the lighthouse. Mind you, in a storm, he'd already set off before the passengers, he left the, the, the getting off of the crew to his second in charge. Um, oh, I guess the, the equivalent of a lieutenant in the Navy, but it was, it was not Navy, if you get me. Um, now he's walking 20 or so kilometers in the pitch dark through the bush on a virtually trackless bit of thick, thick bush. I mean, you can look at that. It is, the tea tree and acacia scrub and that through here, in some places it is impenetrable. He really had a task. But he set off to use the phone at the lighthouse, okay? Um, 11 hours later, the police in Nara received a message from the keeper of the lighthouse that the Marimbula had just ploughed into the rocks at Whale Point. All hands and crew safe sinking by the stern. Um, now, why Captain O'Connor didn't send a message with the uh, Morse code set or telegraph set that he would have obviously had on board the ship to his office back in Sydney and they could have easily called the authorities, right? But that didn't happen. The ship was sinking by the stern, which is interesting, considering she hit bow first onto the rocks. I think they'd uh, open the uh, scuppers, the seacocks, sorry, <coughs> in the stern, and we're hoping that as the tide came up, she would sink even further. Basically, what I'm saying is it's a bloody insurance job. Now, here's another thing, 14 passengers not 60 or 65, 14 passengers. 
The company was losing money. Some of the cabins had been converted to cruise quarters, so they were no, make, no more selling tickets for that anymore. Sinking by the stern, considering the stern hadn't been damaged. And he's walked all that way to send a message that he could have done with the ship's radio. Uh, I'm really not into conspiracy theories. I'm really not. Um, I think the majority of conspiracy theorists are um, just paranoid rumour mongers and I don't think it just... Conspiracy theories just cloud, it, cloud the water by adding bullshit. But uh, this is a theory for an educated guess. Very possible too. The other thing is that the insurance agents turned up that morning. Which begs the question, were they pro previously warned about what was going on or informed about what was going to happen this night? Because to turn up from Sydney, 100 and, what, 170, 180 kilometres north, in vintage cars if they had them, on a virtually roadless area, is a little bit sus if you ask me. Um, so anyway, that's why. That's my theory on the SS Marimbula. <coughs> I think he picked the time when there was as few passengers as possible. Um, and uh, maybe even the passengers were in on it too. It wouldn't be hard to pull together 14 scout friends. Especially if they were going to get some uh, money out of it for shutting up. Love this big horse pipe here. Look at this. So in uh, in ten years' time, this will be a hundred years old. Look at that, man! Isn't that amazing. I mean, she sailed from Scotland to Australia, for God's sake, through some of the harshest seas on the planet. She must have been. She couldn't have been too unseaworthy, eh? Pretty much to say, it's pretty easy to say that she was unseaworthy after the fact, especially to laymen that didn't know the, the seaworthiness or the specifics of the vessel in question. And uh, no more was heard of Captain Thomas Connor, or O'Connor, sorry. Well, I can't find much on him anyway after that. I think he probably got a golden handshake from the company. Oh, the, comp the, the ship, what was left of it, uh, was auctioned off a um, couple of years later, I think. Scrap metal merchants, something like that. It's a beautiful, wild old place, though. So I'm going to have a, a little bit more of a poke around and see if I can't find a bit of timber to add to my collection of stuff. Like I said, I love maritime things. I know this has got nothing to do with nature or cryptozoology or... Just another thing that I that I really like um, studying and looking into. Um, maybe because I was um, I'm supposed to be related, directly related to um, Edward Young, who was on the bounty, the um, HMS bounty under Captain Bly. You know the, the you know the story mutiny on the bounty and all that well um one of my relatives edward young was a midshipman he was one of the mutineers that stayed behind after um after bligh and his followers were stuck in that boat headed off to batavia um also errol flynn's mother was a young she was actually related to him as well and possessed a um a cutlass from him, which I think is now in the Hobart Museum. So that's why I'm related to Errol Flynn through his mother's side in the Youngs. Maybe that's why I've, I love uh, maritime stuff so much. Don't know. Anyway, thanks for listening. Just an interesting story. Have a lovely day. Oh yeah, that's all. Also, I'm just looking at it. Mr. O'Connor had really wanted to take the ship into safety 
You could have easily ducked into the lee, lee side of the headland there. Under the lee of those hills. Would have been a lot safer there. Instead of cutting right across the bay to here. Hmm. Anyway. <laughs> I hope it was worth it, Mr. O'Connor. See ya, folks.